Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Oregon Rural Health Conference presented by the Oregon Office of Rural Health. My name is Sarah Anderson, and I am the Director of Field Services at the Office of Rural Health, and I'm going to be the moderator of today's session. First, I'd like to thank our partners, our gold partners, All Care Health and the Oregon Rural Health Association, our silver partners, Eastern Oregon Coordinated Care Organization, and the Oregon Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, as well as the River House on the Deschutes, our bronze partner, RQI, and our copper partners, Westcom, the American College of Education, and Inquisite. Their continued support during these difficult times has made it possible for us to offer you this conference at no cost. You should have received an email about our conference app. Uh, use this app to visit our partners' virtual booths and enter to win prizes. Uh, you can network with others and share photos of your practice, providers, or community. We'd really love to see those photos. Before we get into the presentation, I'll go over the technical aspects of the platform so you can have the best experience. Uh, your audio and your video are muted for the session. Um, please ask your questions through the Q&A box at the lower right hand side of your screen. I'll ask those questions to our speakers at the end of the session. If you have technical questions, you can ask them in the Q&A box as well. For the best viewing experience, we suggest the floating panel view. Uh, please see the upper right hand corner of your screen where you can select from the different view options. The presentation and the slides will be posted on our website shortly after the conference. Uh, please complete a survey uh, to obtain your CE credits. Here you'll also have a chance to win a $100 gift card uh, and it also helps us improve the conference. Um, so we really do appreciate your feedback. All right, and to present this session, help for quality improvement overload, what really works in primary care from a decade of Orprin experience. Uh, we have five speakers from the Oregon Rural Practice-Based Research Center, or ORPRIN. Uh, Nancy Elder, uh, who is the director, will join us in the Q&A sec section. Um, and then we also have uh, Court Cox and Laura Ferreira, uh, as well as Colin Conway and Caitlin Dickinson, who are project managers at ORPRIN. Uh, and to clarify, Court and Laura are practice enhancement research coordinators at, at ORPRIN. You can read more about each of these speakers on our conference app and on the webpage, and they'll talk a little about, bit about themselves during their portions of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Colin, Caitlin, Court, and Laura. The floor is yours. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. I'm so glad to be here today. And thank all, a big thanks to all session. We are going to spend about the next hour together, and our goal is to share with you what we at Workrun have found to really work in terms of QI practices and a framework from over a decade of our engagement with Oregon primary care clinics. So during today's session, we're going to start with setting the stage, which will include introducing um, the four speakers that we have here today, and we're also going to set some ground rules. We're going to share with you the message that we hope you leave this presentation understanding, and then we're going to provide some context for this work and describe who we really are at Orprin and what practice facilitation is and what we mean by quality improvement. Um, we're also going to be able to share a case study about how Orprin practice facilitators work with clinics on quality improvement activities. And then finally, we're going to save some time for answering questions. And we actually have some questions that we would love to hear from you about as well. So Sarah, next slide, please. So to begin, I'd like to introduce you to our team. My name is Caitlin Dickinson. I'm a senior research associate and project manager at Orprin, the Oregon Rural Practice-Based Research Network. I am a Portland-based Orprin team member, and I have been with the network for about five years. Over that time, I have been a project manager on four different large-scale quality improvement-based projects. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Court, Cullen, and Laura to each introduce themselves as well. Hey, thanks, Caitlin. <clears throat> 
Uh, my name is Court Cox. I am a practice enhancement research coordinator at Orprin, um, often referred to as a practice facilitator as well. Um, I've been with Orprin for just over a year now, and uh, I work with Caitlin on three different projects and work with Cullen on uh, one project. Um, so I will turn it over to Cullen to introduce himself. Thanks, Court. My name is Colin Conway. As mentioned, I'm a project manager here at Orprin, also based in Portland. Uh, I myself was a perk for the first three or so years here at Orprin uh, and then became a project manager, which is what I, I currently do. So I've had uh, the ability to, to have perspectives of, of doing the facilitation work um, as well as some of my current work. So look forward to sharing some of these experiences with you and we'll hand it over to Laura. Hi, my name is Laura Ferrara and I'm also a practice enhancement research coordinator like Court. And I live and work out of Hood River, Oregon. I've been with uh, Orpra in the network about two years and I'm just really happy to be at the conference today and sharing our work with you. If you can, please share who you are in the chat box. We'd love to know your name, where you work, and your role in your organization. We are asking you to be active participants in this session. Please feel free to share ideas, ask questions, or present comments um, at any time in the chat box, and we are going to be monitoring it and responding as appropriate. And one thing we want to mention before we get started is that the core content of this work represents our experiences and our understanding of the field. You might have some different thoughts and perspectives of how best to do QI, and that's great. We'd love to hear from you at the end of our presentation about what you found to be successful within the field of QI. And thank you so much for being willing to, to learn here with us today. So next slide, please, Sarah. We want to share up front the take home message for this presentation. Here is what we believe to be the core components for successful QI. And today we're going to explain why we believe engaged leadership, quality improvement space, health information, technology capabilities, and processes are foundational for successful quality improvement in primary care settings. Next slide, please. To start, I'm going to share a little bit about our context. We, Port Cullen, Laura, and I work for the Oregon Rural Practice Based Research Network, which we call ORPRIN. ORPRIN was founded in 2002 because of a bond measure passed by Oregonians to increase support for rural communities. We are a practice based research network with a rural emphasis, but we have grown from engaging rural clinics um, to engaging rural, urban, and suburban clinics. And over the past year, nearly 50% of Oregon's primary care clinics have worked with us, and that's about 400 total clinics in the state. With our work, we seek to transform and improve the quality of healthcare and advance primary care knowledge through practice-based research. We have built statewide relationships with primary care clinicians, practices, hospitals, community groups, health systems, payers, and coordinated care organizations. Next slide, thank you. Orprin's mission is to improve health outcomes and equity for all Oregonians. If you aren't familiar with Orprin, I encourage you to look us up. On this slide is our organization's webpage and we do frequently update it. Next slide, please. Orprin is led by a 14 member advisory board. You might recognize some of these names and faces. Um, these are individuals that provide guidance for ORPRIM projects and help inform us of important and relevant considerations and perspectives of primary care, especially in rural areas in our state. Next slide, please. Over the course of our 18 year history, we've worked on over 120 projects. Each year we compile a portfolio of our projects, which is what is showcased here. We do have several projects that are actively recruiting. Um, if you are interested in engaging with us at any point in time, please don't hesitate to um, reach out to one of us on today's call, or you can always review um, the, this link below and um, check out what kind of opportunities we have available. Next slide, please. So now I've shared with you a little bit about who we are, but what do we do? You can change it to the next slide, please. So Orprin's main goal is to move beyond traditional research, where work is isolated, generally, 
to sharing evidence with partners in a way that they can use it in practice. Um, many of you have probably heard these stats before, but what we have found through literature reviews is that 45% of care is not based on available evidence and that it takes an average of 17 years to get new knowledge into practice. And even when that happens, the application of that knowledge is highly uneven. Workrun seeks to address the gaps between new knowledge generation and putting that knowledge into practice. Next slide, please. This is a seminal article from former Orkrin director, um, Dr. L.J. Fagnan, that also highlights factors that contribute to the gap between research and practice. One thing that was discovered is that gaps arise because of where traditional research occurs and how it is conducted. Next slide, please. We know that the vast majority of patients receive medical care in the ambulatory primary care setting, and yet the majority of clinical research occurs in the academic clinical setting. And we know that clinical research often excludes real populations. Um, further, what's generally efficacious in randomized controlled trials is not always effective in the real world of day-to-day -day practice. So Orphan tries to overcome that gap between research and practice by doing research directly with primary care settings. And now that I've set the stage for who we are and what we do at Orphan, I'm gonna pass the presentation to my colleague, Cork Cox, to share one of the foundational elements of Orphan work and a core component of our quality improvement support with practices, which is practice facilitation. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about <clears throat> who the practice facilitators are at Orprin, uh, and take a deeper dive into <clears throat> what our important role is in working with primary care clinics. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So uh, Orprin is, as Caitlin based, or mentioned, based in Portland. Uh, we also have regional offices staffed by practice facilitators throughout the state. Uh, Laura's in Hood River. I myself am in Medford, Oregon working with clinics in Southwest and Southeastern Oregon. We also have a practice facilitator in Eastern Oregon and one in Bend as well. And uh, true to the goal of practice-based research networks, practice facilitators implement research and QI initiatives while really focus on, focusing on building and maintaining relationships beyond those individual research studies. Uh, next slide, please. So what is a practice facilitator? Uh, well, we fill a, a variety of different roles, but we're primarily trained to provide tailored support to primary care facilities, uh, utilize different uh, tools and tactics for practice improvement, and build capacity for sustainability. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, what we kind of call the soft skills of practice facilitators. And while they are soft skills, uh, I like to think that some of these soft skills can be uh, challenging to learn. Uh, the tools that we use in quality improvement, like PDSA cycles and fishbone diagrams, uh, can really be used by anybody. Um, but we believe that the practice facilitation skills can help move practices forward more efficiently. Uh, many of the skills that we use or many of these soft skills are uh, used in motivational interviewing, so you may be familiar with some of them. Uh, the first one that I'd like to highlight uh, is included in our name, uh, which is facilitation. So practice facilitators are really working to make things easier or to help bring about change within practices. Uh, as a facilitator, I like to joke that I don't actually do anything. Uh, that my role is really to support clinics and making change that helps them improve care. Uh, listening is a big part of this, and much of the work that we do to lay the groundwork for change is listen to what staff are saying. Uh, as an objective third party, uh, we have a little bit more leeway to ask hard questions that can help us uh, work with the clinic to create a better shared understanding of challenges. Uh, one of the key ways that we do this is by framing and reframing the conversations that occur. And you probably know this is an important skill used in motiva motivational interviewing. And you're probably familiar with hearing some of these tactics in practice, especially when you're in a conversation with somebody 
and they are asking you uh, or stopping to say, uh, just so I understand correctly, or what I'm hearing you say is uh, these motivational inter interviewing techniques are used to clarify uh, what's being said, but this reframing also gives people an opportunity to elaborate. And this is just another step in creating that shared understanding in the room. Uh, and then last, we work to develop skills and create capacity within clinics. Our ultimate goal as facilitators is to more or less work ourselves out of, the, out of our job. And we really want to support clinics in developing uh, the skills to solve problems and be confident in their abilities doing so uh, moving forward. So we know that quality improvement is an integral and ubiquitous part of healthcare and nearly all practices are doing it in some way. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about improving care and lowering the costs of care, and we know that it can be challenging when we have a vested interest in the outcome, and facilitators really come in to help primary care practices uh, bridge that gap. Uh, next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about those soft skills and tools practice facilitators use, like PDSA cycles and fishbone diagrams. Uh, what this, this slide really reiterates the power of pairing practice facilitation skills uh, with a QI toolkit. Uh, will you click one more time, please? There you go. Thank you. Um, so this qualitative study highlights the impact of having practice facilitation or a practice facilitator supporting clinics as a sort of cheerleader. So uh, this uh, pop out here uh, says that toolkits can be help, helpful, but also intimidating. They are different than working with a practice facilitator or another clinic that's done QI before. And it's different ha than having a practice facilitator in the practice to actually help make the change. Uh, we all know the power of having someone help us make change or fix things. This is why we hire personal trainers for physical fitness or seek out mentorship and guidance in our professional lives. Uh, we know that having someone to help us interpret, inter or excuse me, uh, interpret tools and hone in our skills is super helpful. Next slide, please. And we know that practice facilitation is effective. It's supported by the literature. Uh, practices that work with, with practice facilitators are nearly three times as likely to adopt evidence-based practices, and this can lead to improved care for patients. Next slide, please. So we know that healthcare, like most industries, uh, move and change so rapidly that we often don't pause or stop to ask uh, why we're doing something. And there's a lot of fear, I think, around this single question. And oftentimes we don't really know why we're doing things a certain way. Uh, maybe it's the way that things have always been done. But when a practice facilitator starts working with a practice, our ultimate goal is this. We want to create a space uh, for clinics to ask why they're doing things a certain way. And this really helps to inform everything that we do with practices uh, moving forward. Uh, until we can understand and answer this question, change can be extremely challenging. Uh, however, that's not to say that once we work with clinics and answer this question, that makes it easier. But when practices can answer this question, it really gives permission uh, to explore the processes and look at better ways of providing care. Um, next slide, please. So now I'm going to turn it over to Cullen to discuss quality improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Court. Uh, so many of you are aware, as Court mentioned, QI is an integral part of virtually all practices. But I want to spend a, a brief moment uh, refreshing and defining quality improvement uh, and then hash out how Orprin historically has, has used quality improvement through facilitation and what we've learned. Uh, throughout those those years of, of QI. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. So this is a, a long uh, definition of QI, and I think the way I break this down is that QI really does require everyone's effort, from the, the care teams within a practice to their patients, uh, researchers and facilitators like ourselves, pairs and beyond. And it, it really, those collective efforts lead to changes in, in patient outcomes, uh, system performance and workflows, professional development and, and uh, satisfaction in, in your job. Um, and when QI is working well, it becomes this intrinsic part of, of everyone's um, 
job function and everyday life within a clinic and it becomes ingrained in the culture there and kind of drives on its own as court said that's when he's worked himself out of a job so um next slide please Tara. so one of the foundational uh, frameworks of qi is the model for improvement which is a simple but very effective uh model and if broken down in its basic form it's three questions the first question is what are we trying to accomplish and, and that's setting a basic goal of what are we hoping to achieve uh, the second piece is how will we know that change is an improvement and that's really laying out clear and quantifiable measures of, of success so we know that the changes we're making are having the intended impact and then the, the third piece is um, what are the changes we're going to utilize in order to, to make those changes and test, um, test for success. So um, next slide, one of the, the big pieces of that is creating the goal or the aim statement. And that's setting where we want to get. And the best aim statements utilize these SMART goals, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. They're specific, so we clearly define where we're trying to improve. Uh, they're measurable, as I mentioned, how are we um, understanding and measuring that we are making the changes um, that are having the intended impact. They're attainable, so they're reasonably, it's understood that we can reasonably achieve these. Um, they're relevant to a topic that we're hoping to, uh, to improve and they're time bound. So we, we've set some, um, set a time frame with which we're hoping to achieve these goals. Uh, next slide. So on the left side, you'll see the model for improvement, which I briefly covered. Uh, and so that's where we set our goal and where we're trying to get. And I think the handy tool underneath this is, is the smaller scale uh, PDSA cycle or the plan, do, study, act cycle. And this is an iterative small scale uh, test of change that helps drive a lot of quality improvement. And I think a lot of PDSAs go on without being defined a PDSA within a, a practice. Um, but they're uh, a small scale iterative test of change, as I mentioned. So the first piece of that is the plan. What are we going to do? What, what's our objective? And, and how are we going to tackle this issue? Second is just doing it, trying this plan out and, and carrying it out and starting to collect some data on what's happening as we do it. The third is looking at these efforts, the data we're, we're able to collect and, and studying it uh, and seeing what impact it's having. And then the act, uh, the final stage act is evaluating if, did the changes have our intended impact? Uh, if so, do we want to expand it to a, a larger scale? And if not, how might we tweak this to try it again and, and initiate that second round of PDSAs. And I'll say most PDSAs do involve several rounds of, of slightly changing our efforts um, until we're able to really get to where we're trying to go. Uh, next slide. So as we're setting our measurement and again, determining that the changes we're making are, are having the intended effect and, and actually leading to improvement, there are different ways to do that. And, and so a few different types of measures here, uh, there are outcome measures, which um, from what comes to mind for me is, is a blood pressure metric within a clinic where it's tied to a patient's actual blood pressure reading. And so if you have a hypertensive patient whose blood pressure is out of control, it, were we able to get their blood pressure under control? And uh, that's tied to their actual blood pressure. That's an outcome measure. Process measures are, are, are we actually improving the care we're providing and the processes within that? So um, something like smoking cessation, if a patient walks in our doors, have we screened that patient for smoking? And if they are a smoker, have we referred them to a quit line? Um, that's not tied to the patient quitting smoking, but it's tied to us going through the appropriate processes to, uh, to support that patient. Uh, and then balancing measures are, are set up so that we can really see if changes we're making in one area are actually having impacts in others and, and balancing to make sure that we're accounting for that. Uh, so all of these are used in our QI efforts to make sure that we are moving in the, in the correct direction and having the intended outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. 
Court touched on a couple of these tools that facilitators uh, utilize with clinics. Um, you'll see workflow diagrams here, fishbone diagrams, uh, run charts with data. And this is really to show that um, these ways of visualizing both our processes and our outcomes and, and our data can be really effective to take that moment of pause and, and say, this is how we're doing it now, or this is where we're at right now. How might we make some of these changes um, to effectively improve our processes or our outcomes? And so uh, this is just a quick snapshot of what some of those tools look like, but they're, they're quite common in quality improvement efforts. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna to touch briefly on a few projects that have uh, leaned heavily on quality improvement over, over recent years. Uh, the first slide uh, is Healthy Hearts Northwest, which you may be familiar with. It was uh, a three-year project with 250 primary care practices around the Pacific Northwest, uh, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. And this was focused on the ABCS, the ABCs of cardiovascular health. So aspirin for high-risk patients, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, and smoking cessation. And facilitators really uh, worked closely with practices to uh, make improvements in those metrics and support patients in their cardiovascular care and, and used a wide variety of quality improvement skills based on where those clinics wanted to focus and, and their capabilities. Um, the next study is RAVE, the uh, next slide, please, the Rural Adolescent Vaccine Enterprise. Uh, this is focused on increasing HPV vaccination rates in um, adolescent, uh, adolescents aged 11 to 17 years old. And it's currently going on. 45 practices around Oregon are participating. And it, too, um, leverages a lot of those same quality improvement components that we've just touched on. And the last study on the next slide is uh, antecedent, which is focused on uh, unhealthy alcohol use and utilizing uh, brief intervention, screening, and, and medication-assisted treatment uh, to uh, address unhealthy alcohol use among patients. And this is, again, also going on currently 150 primary care clinics and CCOs, uh, and similarly using these QI approaches. So having touched just briefly on a few study examples, I wanted to uh, spend the next few slides describing uh, what we at Orprin have learned um, from the past 10 years or so of doing QI with clinics around the state. And this first slide shows um, uh, it is a quote from the Healthy Hearts Northwest project that I just touched on. Uh, and it, what I take from this is, is a, something that I think we all know here in this room that, that primary care practices and health systems don't have a, a ton of extra time or staffing uh, to take on more work. And there's not a lot of organizational slack to be engaging in additional efforts. And so this, the highlighted quote here says, an offer to give free swimming lessons to a drowning person, no matter how well-intentioned, may not be enthusiastically received, just get me out of the water. And I think that resonates with a lot of us that um, QI and engaging in some of these projects can be seen as an additional burden. Uh, and that's where the facilitator really comes in um, to help practices um, tackle some of these efforts and projects in a way that um, is manageable and in the end actually can free up more time by making things more efficient and effective and, and satisfying and job satisfaction. So um, next slide, please. I think one of the big learnings um, and, and kind of playing off what I just touched on that a, an original approach to quality improvement and the way it's perceived, I think, by a lot of people is, is that it's very prescriptive to programmatic goals. So if we think, again, to use Healthy Hearts Northwest as an example here, uh, you could say we're just going to walk in uh, to a clinic and say we need to improve the blood pressure metric. And in order to do so, we're going to change our workflows and that will fix the blood pressure metric. And 
that that's based on a lot of linear assumptions um, that we can just tweak one thing here and it will result in the intended impact there. And that doesn't, that misses a lot of the complexities and interrelationships, uh, interrelations within all primary care practices or health systems. I think there, it's really more of an ecosystem where one change affects things in other places that you don't always understand. And that's where um, the facilitator can be such a, a benefit of helping clinics stop and, and um, thoughtfully and deliberately thinking about how to make the, the changes that are going to have intended effects without being too over, overwhelming or scary. So um, the next slide shows the, the four components that Caitlin led with that we've identified as very fundamental to uh, effective QI and where, where facilitators are able to work with clinics to have the, the best impact um, in these efforts. So again, these are engaged leadership, quality improvement space, health information, technology capabilities, and those overall quality improvement processes. And so to demonstrate this, we came up with uh, the, the next slide shows what we call the quality improvement engine. And I think what I wanna point out here <clears throat> is, is what I was describing as those interrelations and the complexities within practice and as having been a former facilitator i each practice has their own unique um priorities bandwidth issues um and and areas where focus on improvement would be most beneficial and uh that's why those overly prescriptive quality improvement approaches don't generally work uh, because they don't take into account um, some of those those things you may not have written into your, your project um, goals. And so facilitators can come in and, and help identify using this engine as an analogy, where, which cog or gear in this engine uh, actually needs to be addressed. And sometimes that falls outside of your programmatic goals. But when you're able to work with a practice to identify, um, let's say that, that um, there isn't space to consider alternatives or leadership has not deemed this a priority or in empowered staff to um, think about these issues. Um, facilitators can help identify that and work with, with the team to um, get that engine gear running. And usually through those efforts, uh, the whole engine begins running uh, more smoothly and that opens up space for that full um, full quality improvement uh, functionality, but also the clinic um, being able to provide those, those goals of better patient outcomes and, and systems. So this next slide is actually a quote you've already seen, but to re reiterate everything I've just covered, I think facilitators help to um, identify, work with practices on areas that need, would, would be uh, beneficial to focus on with these QI efforts. And in doing so, it, it becomes an ingrained part of the culture at that uh, clinic and uh, ends up improving the patient outcomes, the um, overall processes, and hopefully staff satisfaction. Um, so I will pause there and hand it over to Laura Ferrara for a, a case study in this work. Hi, thanks, Colin. So again, my name is Laura Ferrara, and I am a PERC, <clears throat> excuse me, a Practice Enhancement Research Coordinator, or uh, I like to call myself a Practice Facilitator. And again, I'm in Hood River, Oregon, but I do work with practices all over the state, uh, especially in the Columbia River Gorge area. Um, and I want to talk today about one of the specific projects that we work on. Next slide, please. But first, before we get into the nitty gritty, this is a picture. These windmills are on the drive over to Condon, where I have visited um, South Gillum Health Center. There's tons and tons of windmills out there, and I always like to stop and look at them. And sometimes the clouds are there, sometimes they're not. And in this one, there are some rain clouds, which you just never know with quality improvement what you're going to, what's going to happen. So I like to um, weather any kind of storm um, 
focusing on these four concepts. And I have them here as really strong relationships. So with the practices I work with, um, no matter how long or short, that making our relationships so they last and maybe they go into the future is super important. Remaining flexible within a project, around a project is really important too. Getting really creative in the work we do. No practice is the same. And I say that over and over again, and I see it over and over again, and I'm always amazed that we as facilitators have to be really creative in the work that we do to add meaningful, relevant um, help. And lastly, leveraging what we have. And often that's time, but sometimes it's not. Uh, in the example I'm about to talk about, time is something that Rave has because it's a longer project. Uh, next slide, Sarah, please. All right, so the Rural Adolescent Vaccine Enterprise. And Cullen mentioned this uh, a few slides as one of the examples. This is an ongoing project happening right now uh, we have about 45 uh, practices has signed up, and we work with them to boost adolescent vaccine, HPV vaccine rates in rural areas. It's an 18-month-long project, and we check in with practices monthly, and we work really intensively on quality improvement uh, usually pretty PDSA cycle based. We do a, up front, we do a lot of education with practices, making sure we're all on the same page about concepts. And then we springboard from there and work with practices where they're at on um, what they'd like to work on. So typically for RAVE, again, it says here 60, a 60 minute meeting monthly. We ask the, the practices to huddle weekly every other week so they're working on the project without uh, facilitation as well. The overall project, like I said, wants to increase HPV vaccine rates, but also we aim to boost QI capacity in a practice on any topic. So it's it's really seen as a, a education as well. Uh, one of the components about RAVE is to Yes, practices to build community connections that help support um, the promotion of the HPV vaccine. And we also do a parent survey. Okay, so this is the rave plan, if you will, in normal pre-COVID time. So let's see what has happened, okay? So COVID-19 has affected everyone, including our project. Uh, and just really, really briefly, um, I wanted to talk about what's happened and going back to being flexible, having strong relationships, leveraging what we have. Okay, so the 60 minute monthly check in diminished, especially in those early months, March, April, May, when we were all trying to figure out what's happening and how to deal with it. Uh, our facilitation time on the project went way down. We saw and continue to see diminished community partnerships, especially with practices who were working with schools. Um, it's really hard to work with schools if they're not in session, right? And overall, just a less of a QI emphasis um, and capacity. That said, we've had some practices who have really doubled down on the project who do have staff capacity, even having more staff time because they were seeing less patients and have really shined during this time. So, like I said before, no practice is the same, especially how um, everyone reacts to COVID. And different months are different. So we just continue to remain in contact with these practices. We serve as sounding boards and support where they need it. Sometimes it's not even HPV related at this point. Um, and we understand when, H, uh, when PDSA cycles just aren't a priority. Again, with the long game in mind in that we want to stay connected with the practices, we want to maintain our good relationships, and that we're always there for them when they're ready to pick back up and work. Again, that's leveraging our time frame, right? This is an 18 month long project. 
if they took a couple months to regroup over COVID and say, okay, we'll work with you when you can come back. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted to get into the nitty gritty and provide an example of a PDSA cycle um, and the goal of it and what happened um, really because of the times that we're in and the COVID reality, okay? So as you probably, or you may or may not know, uh, the HP vaccine is a multi-dose vaccine and it takes um, one to two boosters depending on the age of the patient when they first receive it, okay? One of the big challenges we see, pretty much practice wide, is creating a recall system to get the patient back into the practice for their booster in the right time frame, in the CDC recommended time frame. So some practices uh, do okay with this, other practices, this is a tall order. And there are many, many factors that contribute um, to whether or not this is an easy go or a hard go. But one practice I'm going to talk about deci decided that at the time they could not um, schedule, let's see, how did it go? No, I'm sorry. What their ultimate goal was they wanted to be able to schedule a patient to come back in within six months for their second dose um, at the time that the first dose was given, right? So the patient gets their first dose, they check out, and the parent um, makes an appointment to come back in for that second dose. Sounds pretty easy, right? So yeah, it works, right? Well, getting that information to the front desk schedulers was kind of hard, it proved hard. So they came up with an idea that they would a template and they would put it on, they also use a super bill, a bright piece of paper with the type of appointment and the, um, the date that they should come in by. The patient brings that up to the front desk and when they check out, and if something happens where the patient didn't do that, they had a secondary way to get it to the front desk. They were very excited about this. However, it did not work out. They, they documented their PDSA cycle. And at the end, we always um, go through when we say, okay, are we going to adopt this, adapt this, or abandon this small test of change we just tried? And they said, we're abandoning it. We can't do this. Our staff, half of, half of our front desk staff are not coming in in the mornings because they have to be with their young school age kids doing distance learning right now. And then when staff member got sick, things come up, okay? And that's why we do these small tests of change, these PDSA cycles. So they said, no, we don't wanna do this right now. Maybe when we have more staff and when things are feeling better, so they, they were funny. They parking lotted it, but still it's an abandonment, but they put it in the parking lot. And instead they leveraged their um, EHR, uh, Greenway Time Sweep, and they created a tickler system to notifies them that they need to call the practice to make an appointment, okay? So you see how that they, they rolled with the change and actually, I think of it as an adaptation. And now they're doing this small test of change where they're using their EHR for a defined amount of time, like four or five weeks, to see if this, if this works for them. Next slide, please. Okay, so there are some examples of uh, incorporating flexibility. I also um, didn't mention this, but we were meeting with practices quarterly in person. And that's my favorite part is to sit down and really talk to people face to face. Uh, that of course has disappeared with COVID. We are now all virtual platform and I hope that can change soon. Uh, the PDSA cycle, I just wanted to say uh, one last thing about it. And that is reflecting back on Colin's great QI machine with all those gears that we saw. And my favorite gears, of course, are the QI space and the QI process. I mean, those are, that's what we deal in, in, in practice facilitation, all of those gears, but especially those two gears. And I was thinking about this and the PDSA cycle, imagine the PDSA cycle as an enormous rubber band 
Uh, my kids have these little gear machines. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're plastic. You can put them together and then you can add a tool to it like this, this rubber band that actually makes two of the beer gears go faster. The PDSA cycle kind of holds those gears together tighter, if you will, sometimes. And no matter if it's abandoned in the end, like that one example I gave, it still was a learning process for the whole team, even up until the end. Rather than just throwing it in the can, they parking lotted it, they documented it all, and maybe it will be resurrected one day. Okay, next slide. Thank you. And, and this is the last slide I have, um, just more reflection on average facilitation times in the spring. Okay, so January through May, we should have estimated times, but this is what I have for you. Just look at 49, 59 minutes. This is per month with RAVE practices for the RAVE project. And we just saw that dip way down, especially March down to 25, April 13 minutes. Okay. Again, sticking with the concept that we really wanted to maintain relationships during these times and something like those 10, 13 minute um, meetings, they might have been phone calls in the end. All right. Talk about this today and I will pass it off to Caitlin. Thank you, Laura. Well, we are at the end of our presentation. And so, Sarah, you can, thank you. Um, to conclude, we want to share with you again what we have found to be the components to successful QI. So you're walking away um, again with this framework in mind. Thank you, Sarah. In order to succeed in QI, we see clinics have engaged leadership, as Colin discussed, the QI space and processes in place, and HIT capabilities. Um, and this is what really helps clinic teams move forward effectively with quality improvement. <clears throat> Next slide, please. We do have some questions that we'd love to ask you, including do you do QI? What do you think are the most important elements for successful QI? Have you seen changes in your processes and structure since the onset of COVID-19, like Laura described for a RAVE project? Um, please feel free to start answering some of these questions in the chat box or following this formal recording. We're going to have the space to hear it directly from you. Next slide, please. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, we are excited to be able um, to share with you the lessons that we've learned over the past decade plus um, at Orprint. If you would like to learn more about Orprin or the content of this presentation, we will provide with, um, you with our email addresses and Orprin website. Um, <clears throat> and now we are going to open it up for a question and answer session. I just want to say thank you again and pass it back to Sarah. Thanks so much, Caitlin and everyone. Um, you did a terrific job. We really appreciate your presentation. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, we're going over to the question and answer period now. Uh, and please remember that you can ask your questions in the Q&A box to the right of your screen. Thanks again. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the live Q&A portion of our session. So as a reminder, you can use the um, box, the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen to ask some questions and see that there are, have already been some questions there. Um, we are going to start with our first question. Um, so uh, for whichever one of you wants to answer, how do you select the projects that you offer? Caitlin, you might still be muted. Uh, I can't hear you. I'm not sure which of our team is uh, answering. Is is Caitlin trying to answer and having problems? Yeah, Nancy, Caitlin was trying to answer, but we can't hear her. 
Who okay. to take it? I'll take it. Uh, my name is Nancy Elder, and um, I have the privilege of uh, being the director of Orprin and working with these amazing people that have just spoken to you. And I would say we choose to answer or join in projects and lead projects uh, based on about uh, three main factors. Um, one is, um, is it a need in Oregon? Um, is it a value to patients and to clinics? Is it something that's important? And we assess that both by hearing from our um, people like Court and Laura who are out in the communities, um, listening to our advisory board, which was discussed early in the um, thing, and also uh, communicating with partners um, directly with uh, practices, with patients, with uh, um, uh, Oregon Health Authority, with the CCOs. Uh, secondly, uh, is there money available to do this project? Um, is there a grant? Is there a uh, project? Is there a uh, funding agency? Um, the OHA, the federal government, uh, PCORI, a um, foundation that could fund us to do such a project. Um, and thirdly, will we, when we finish this project, working with our partners throughout Oregon, is there a good chance that whatever we end up doing will help us meet our mission, which is to improve outcomes, health outcomes and health equity across the state? So I think those are kind of the three things. Is it important to people in Oregon? Will it make a difference in health outcomes and health equity? And is there somebody who's going to fund us to do the work? Great. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we just have time for one more question um, so that we can transition over to the next session. Um, but Jake asks, how do you work with hesitant resistance in records? You know, that's a really great question. I may uh, see if Court or Laura have thoughts uh, being current perks. I know when I was a perk, that was a really tricky one. And often um, <clears throat> it, it required leaning on those soft skills that I believe Court mentioned, um, figuring out what that resistance was coming from. If it was, well, I don't have time for this, or I'm, I'm focused on these other priorities and seeing how we can align our our mission and goals and priorities and, and so i think it required several meetings of listening and working together to identify what those what what was the root cause of resistance and do we have a common cause to be working for is this the right fit and in doing so identifying some commonalities and areas to focus on it that's part of that toolkit and the soft skills that Court mentioned, and I think what makes those perks particularly effective is being able to roll with the resistance and find the, the commonalities there. So it's a tough one, though. Thank you, Colin. Um, and I uh, don't have very much time for the Q&A, but um, we are going to we see your questions a box um, and we'll make sure that the group gets those questions and can answer them um, and we'll post them on our website along with the uh, recording of this session and the slides. Um, so we are going to wrap up right now and take a short break and return at 10 o'clock to hear Making Google and Rate MD Your Ally and Friend with Jake Hansen and Craig Stewart of Sur Solutions, as well as Julie Russell of Adco Agency. Uh, thank you so much, Nancy, Caitlin, Court, Laura, and Colin, um, and everyone for attending this session.